Welcome to Phenomenology. My name is Mark Thorsby, and in this video, we're going to be taking a look at Emmanuel Levinas's text on otherness, uh, totality, and infinity. So, welcome back, everyone. As you already know, if you've been watching the videos, um, and, and we what we've been doing is really a close reading of Levinas's text, uh, a much closer reading than. Um, maybe you were bargained for. Um, we've looked at, for instance, his conception of the other, right? And the notion that really what Levinas is doing here is arguing that the other is what grounds us in a first relationship, a, a metaphysical relationship that's ultimately ethics. And he takes this position that ethics is first philosophy. And in the previous videos, we, for instance, discussed his conception of separation and discourse. And on the one hand, Levinas takes very seriously the idea that the other is truly other, which means that the other cannot be, as it were, condensed and reduced into the in, into this, what, he, what Levinas calls the same, into the interiority of my consciousness, if you will. So the other has to be understood as something which is transcendent. Um, and therefore, our relationship to the other is one that's asymmetrical. Um, the, the way in which we are able to constitute a relation with the other is through language and through discourse. Um, and we've seen, we've seen previously, and we're going to see Levinas deepen this sense by his conception of the face. And the face is really describes the phenomenological situation in, in which I encounter the other. Language is the mean by which the other reveals him or herself or itself to us. Um, and we talked about how for Levinas, this really grounds a conception of truth and justice. Um, and so what we're going to do today is, oh, and then finally we talked about the notion of separation um, and the absoluteness of the other, right? And so, um, and one of the things too is that Levinas thinks that we be, he begins by his, if you will, his ontology of the human situation is one in which we're essentially atheistic, right? one in which we are characterized by an egoistic sense of enjoyment, right? We experience and we live in the world in terms of trying to enjoy ourselves in a variety of ways. Um, and that, but the, that enjoyment really ends with the, um, uh, the announcement of the other through language and my recognition of the other's face. And this creates a situation which ultimately for Levinas, we are categorically, or, or I should say preeminently, bounded by by the other um, and by a call for the other and responsibility becomes sort of first philosophy. Um, in today's video we're going to finish off our discussion of Levinas and we're actually going to be looking at section three of his book Exteriority and the Face. We're going to see here he really talks about language in really some fantastic ways and then ultimately talks about what it means to have sense of the other um, and then finally, he talks about temporality. And um, my remarks today on temporality will be fairly curt, but I will try to give you a pretty straightforward interpretation of Levinas in, in terms of the sensibility of the face and the ethics of the face. Um, I should say too before we begin that this will be our final video in phenomenology. It's not to say that there's not a lot more we could be talking about, but we've simply run out of time at this point at the end of the course. Um, so maybe potentially in the future I'll add videos and I encourage you to take a look at those, but if not, I hope that these videos have helped you in your reading and your understanding of phenomenology. Um, so I want to say thank you uh, for taking the course. It's been a pleasure having you join me. Um, so let's sort of jump into it. And we're going to start off here by talking about sensibility in the face. And here we're going to see that Levinas wants to make an important distinction between our sensibility of ordinary phenomena and our sensibility of the face. That is, for Levinas, the exteriority of the other has a, a, an important phenomenological difference in terms of the, the, the brute way in which we have sensations of others. Notice that within the history of philosophy, um, the other has typically been understood in terms of a sensation where all things are neutrally the same, um, and we sense them, and we organize them in consciousness, and so on and so forth. Really, in many ways, this is the Husserlian model, uh, though that's a simplistic version of it. Uh, we're going to see that Levinas says, no, 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 we have sensation, but the sensibility of the face, of the other, is something really that's a, a qualitatively different phenomena. At least it's um, qualitatively different phenomenologically. Um, so we're going to begin there. So let's sort of go through it. Um, so first off, 
uh, Levinas begins by sort of asking, well, how is the face different from the things that we ordinarily perceive? Um, so for instance, I have a cup of water here. Um, and when I perceive the water, I have a sensation, right? And I have a whole range of phenomena that we could characterize really in Husserlian terms or even general empirical terms. Um, and in terms of phenomenology, of course, the, the, the clue there would be to follow up the intentionality of your perception, right? But Levinas says, listen, this means that sensation is an abstraction, right? The, the, to say that I'm sensing the cup, right, is an abstraction from the sort of intentional correlates which are necessary for me to experience it. Um, but what, what this whole, so that's the first thing to recognize, is that sensation is an abstraction. Sensation here is not something that we should treat as um, simple. And when I mean simple, I don't mean easy to understand. I mean simple in the sense that uh, we shouldn't uh, think of sensation as, as the beginning point, as it were. At least it's not logic. It's not that which is logically prior for the in phenomenology. So sensation, since sensation is an abstraction, that means that uh, ultimately um, there's deeper, if you will, deeper deeper correlates for what's happening in our ordinary sensation process. Now, combined with this, in, in we've skipped over at this point in the video series, we've skipped over a huge section in which Levinas really has emphasized and made his argument regarding the nature of enjoyment and um, and, and the general individual. And he doesn't use that term, but um, the, the sort of founding sense of our own experience is organized phenomenologically by intentions of enjoy enjoyment. But here it's important to remember that enjoyment characterizes sensation whose quote, representational content dissolves into their affective content. So what does that mean? Here, remember, there's a distinction between something has representational content if it refers to something else. It represents something else, the way a letter, a word represents um, a concept, for instance. Um, now, to talk about affectivity, right, is to talk about ultimately um, the things, it's to talk about um, and I, I should have pulled up here his exact definition of this, uh, but to talk about that which is affective is to talk about, if you will, the way in which we're emotionally vested with the world, right? And the way in which we um, um, understand things according to um, their their means as or means towards enjoyment. So if we take enjoyment seriously, um, then that means that it is something which ultimately probably has a generative and a constituting effect on sensation. Um, so that means that when enjoyment characterizes sensation, that means that what something means in terms of, I pick up the cup and it's cold, right? I have a representation that it is cold, but that representation dissolves, ultimately gives way to the affective content. That's why I wanna drink this because I'm thirsty or something like this. And I enjoy um, alleviating myself of that thirst, right? Um, drinking. So you can see here, so once we begin to understand, we see that, okay, so sensation is organized according to this to this logical principle here of enjoyment, uh, or this phenomenological principle. So that means enjoyment is crystallizing the object and the subject, the I and the non-I. So, um, so when I'm holding the cup, it's a non-I, right? And I'm an I, but my relationship here, as it dissolves into the affective, right, is one in which um, I become one with the thing, not one in the sense that I am the thing, but one in the sense that um, our relationships become crystallized to each other. So there's sort of unity that can, can, can be generated out of this. So at least that's how I'm understanding this. Now, jumping here to the question of vision, right? Because when we talk about, um, when we talk about recognizing the other's face, um, obviously, in the, at the beginning here, you would think about the way in which I can see the other. We're going to see here that uh, Levinas, along with many other philosophers, all the way from Kant, Heidegger, Plato, Descartes, Augustine, and many others, have emphasized the priority of vision as a, as a philosophical concept, right? The idea that vision is something which is the most loved of the senses. In fact, I believe Aristotle says the very same thing, or says that. Um, so vision for him is the means. Now we're going to see though that vision doesn't vision here is understood phenomenologically, not in terms of the types of sense data that it can be that we're taught that they can be given in an ordinary visual experience. So what does that mean? It means that we're going to see that vision 
uh, for him refers to something more than just sensation of light. Um, and in fact, um, right, is the vision doesn't necessarily even require the physical light, right? We can talk about things, for instance, um, our vision, our philosophical visions, right? And other sorts of vision in different contexts, in different ways, right? He says, but, but following up here with the, but, but beginning here, Levinas begins with this sort of understanding of this ordinary conception. He says, the eye does not see the light, but the object in the light. Vision is therefore a relation with a something established within a relation that's not a something, right? So when I'm looking at the water, I see the object. The, the water or the glass of water is the something, but I'm seeing it through something which is not a something, but clearly has to be there. So we have an interesting dynamic in terms of the relation um, the relations that must be constituted in vision here, right? Um, and I'm going to be skipping over this because I want to sort of keep things going. But he does have a long discussion here about the way in which vision, his, his, this conception of vision is both uh, um, resisted and yet embedded within the history of philosophy. In fact, he, he directly will mention Heidegger here. He says, quote, for Heidegger, an openness, oops, let me make it a little smaller, an openness upon being, which is not a being, which is not a something, is necessary in order um, for a something to manifest itself, right? And in the rather formal fact that an existent is, in its work or its exercise of being, in its very independence, resides its intelligibility. So keep here that intelligibility is ultimately given through something here which is not intelligible. Thus appears the structure of vision where the relation of the subject and object is subordinated to the relation of the object with the void of openness, which is not an object. It's also here to remember, we didn't go over this in our series, but ultimately Heidegger will, at the end of Being in Time, talk about being as, a, as an openness, as a clearing. So. Uh, he's directly thinking of really the latter portions of being in time. Um, the comprehension of an ex I'm sorry, uh, the comprehension of existent consists in precisely going beyond the existent into the open. So to comprehend the particular being is to apprehend it out of an illuminated sight that it does not fill. Uh, so there's this interesting uh, critique and analysis that that Levinas is doing when he's thinking about vision and Heidegger. And of course, Heidegger discusses this as well. Um, so the not something of vision here is an infinite space or a void, right? Um, so the, the means by which something is given through not something, the not something is not because it's a void. It's an, it's in, it reveals an infinite space, a clearing, right? This is something that's different than the, per, the perception that I get if I just touch something, right? When I just touch something, um, I have, as it were, an immediate con um, contact between myself and the something, that something. Um, but in vision, I get an infinite space without having that contact because there is, if you were, a medium. Now, the medium, of course, physically is light, um, right? That's, that's what we would talk about here. But it's important here to think about, well, this, this space, uh, this void, right? Um, it reveals us, he said, well, he has this remark, right? He says on 190, he says, the silence of infinite spaces is terrifying, right? Um, and, and as you know from reading the text, Levinas is, is frequently given um, to these sorts of kind of strong statements here. And his, his ethical language is certainly burdened, I think, by, uh, by his own personal experience of the horrors of the Holocaust. Um, so there's this, this, but think about it too, right? The infinite space here, right? Um, not just the space of, in which I see something, but the, the infinitude of that space taken in itself is totally overwhelming, right? It, it, um, it sort of is a collision between our first person and third person perspectives um, when we think about it. And, and that's something that in which we seem to be, we just get dissolved into, right? So there's an interesting comment here about the infinitude of space and the way in which our experience of it is, can be terrifying, right? Now, here's a couple of just uh, points here that he makes. He says, illuminated space is not an absolute interval though, right? Um, because ultimately here, remember we're doing phenomenology, that means that when I have vision, my vision slowly in a sort of movement, in a spectrum, gives way to my ability to grasp an object, ultimately to comprehend it. Um, and even, for instance, my vision here, and then I grasp the object, all of that uh, experience is something that doesn't happen in a 
in a sort of absolute interval, but actually occurs, I think, in a sort of movement of interval becoming. That's not Levinas's term, but it's an interesting way potentially to describe it. But it's important here that when we talk about vision, right, and sensibility here, right, vision is not a transcendence itself, right? So vision is not itself a transcendence. So when we talk about our vision of the other, the vision is not, the actual uh, seeing of something is not a transcendence because it's the means ultimately by which the transcendence will be given uh, or is represented in the language that the face tell, gives, right? The speech that others have when they speak to us, right? Vision is actually a sort of forgetting of the there is, right? Um, which is, right? So vision involves not only our recognition of things, but in terms of our enjoyment, right? We're taking enjoyment seriously here. As I enjoy and I see things, right? The, the there is, like right? the, um, the noumenal being of the thing is a, we, it's sort of lost. We forget that. So seeing equals a function of the particularization of the relation to reality, right? Um, so it's the way in which we particular, particularize a certain relationship we have in reality. And it's functional in that way. So what does this mean? It means we have to remember that total alterity is not something to be seen. So when we see the face of there, we do not see the total alterity, right? Um, think about, for instance, um, the way in which we can see someone without the face, um, and it's just a body the way other bodies would appear to us. So if we're talking about the face and the sensibility of it, then how is it different exactly? Well, the alterity of the other can be conceived along the lines of an architectural facade, he says. Uh, and he gives this sort of example, right? So you can think about the way in which there, have you, you've probably been into a building that looked like one thing, and then when you entered it, it looked like another thing, right? Or at least the, the face of it was incongruous potentially with what it ultimately ended the type of building it ultimately is, right? And you can think about another example if you think about Hollywood facades. They Instead of building whole buildings, they would just build the front of the building and then maybe one little set at the bottom, right? Um, so the alternative of the other is something like this, uh, where the visible, right, that I see, right, doesn't give me the alterity, but there's a facade. And that facade, ultimately, you can think of as the face. So the face is, if you will, not just something we see, but it really also represents a moment, an event, right? And it ultimately for him is the event by which the alterity of the other is given to us. So how does this happen? We're going to see that it happens through language and through speech. And this is why, for instance, we can recognize and notice uh, well, we can recognize the other through words, through language. Um, so, but preeminently, this begins always in an ethical relationship with the face. By the way, one thing to think about here is to think about the way in which um, it's much easier for people to conduct um, modes of war against each other if they don't see the other person's face. Um, and we're going to see Levinas doesn't really take this view, but I'm thinking here, for instance, um, for instance, uh, let's say, for instance, if you're a, a, a member of the, the civilian government, a high up member, right, um, and you're involved in, for, like, think of, for instance, here, if you're in the cabinet of the, the presidential cabinet, right, so civilian control of the military, right, and think if you're at that high level, or even if you're the president, right, it certainly would probably be easier to order war on others um, when you don't see their face, when right, they're just uh, numbers and they're just data and so on and so forth. But you can see here how when someone has to commit acts of war on their own, face to face with the enemy, right, that reveals something that, that's much more burdensome, actually, I, I would say, personally. Right? And the burden there is the burden of the, the recognition that the other is other and that there's a relationship by the virtue of that alterity to respect the other and also to, um, and ultimately for Levinas, it's even more extreme than that, that my ethical relationship to the other is ultimately one in which I'm subjected to the other. Um, and really what's left is my appeal not for them to kill me, right? Um, and so you have this interesting sort of tension. Now, let's go here to take this section by section. First here, infinity in the face, okay? So the, ref 
the face here, he says, refuses containment. So you can't contain the face into the totality of the same, right? Remember, the infinity of the face cannot be, the, the infinity that the face ultimately represents or reveals to us is something that can't be contained, right? And remember here that for Levinas, alterity is not just the addition of a distinguishing feature, right? So it's not just that the other has something that I don't, right? Um, because there, think of all the different people you've met and do meet who do have different things than you, right? The alterity here is give, conceptualized as a movement of infinity, right? Is one which is goes beyond any single feature, right? It represents a metaphysical relationship, one in which the other cannot be, as it were, contained. Whoa. Uh, let me go back here. Uh, so when we're talking about the face and the alterity here, we're talking about something which is infinitely formed, right? Something that goes beyond us. So how exactly are we able to both recognize the other and yet not contain the other? And ultimately it's through speech. So speech here proceeds from absolute difference. Um, so this is again the idea that the speech of the other uh, really represents an existential and a metaphysical uh, movement that is radically different from our ordinary sensations of things and the way we size objects up, and we size up their needs, and so on and so forth. Think about, for instance, the difference you have between, for instance, if you have an animal as a pet, a cat or a dog or something. If you have an animal as a pet, right, there is a way in which there is a relationship clearly with that being, but that being, even though it has a face, you recognize its alterity, it has a face, but Without language, without speech, that alterity remains absolute. Absolute to such an extent that it, it seems naturally um, uh, without beyond our reach, right? It's, it's beyond our reach, right? So how is this possible? Through language, right? Language accomplishes a relationship of infinite alterity where the other does not get thematized into the totality of the same, right? And this is maybe the way we can demarcate the difference between the ethical relationship between animals and humans, right? Uh, the, through speech, right, the, the other, the human other, has a way of resisting our tendency to phenomenologically incorporate them into a totality um, given by our means of enjoyment in the world. Notice here that in environmental ethics, for instance, one of the major objections uh, that environmental ethicists make is that we treat other species merely in terms of our enjoyment, right? That, that we treat them as mere means unto an end, as tools uh, that don't have value, in, right? And then there's the discussion of do they really feel um, pain and so on and so forth. On the one hand, of course they do, but on the other hand, they're so um, other than us that it's not, we're not exactly sure what that pain um, would be like for them, right? Um, and notice here how that objection against the usage of animals in terms of enjoyment actually is descriptively explained here for Levinas. Right? Levinas will say, well, because there's no language, right, between the, the non-human animal, that means that they get totalized or thematized into the sort of sensation of enjoyment that I have in the world, right? So language is the means, it's the, it's, the, it's the operation by which the other refuses our thematization. Um, and consequently, it's also, it has to be the way in which we too can um, uh, resist the totalization um, of others by our, uh, we can resist the totalization of others onto us, right? We can resist their thematizations through speech, right? And think here about the importance of political speech. Another phenomenologist, Hannah Arendt, she doesn't have the same analysis, but she does give a phenomenology of speech as being absolutely vital ethically and ultimately politically, right? So language accomplishes this. Levinas says, speaking rather than letting be solicits the other's speech across vision. So here, um, language is something that's given into our vision. So you can see here, we're not just talking about what we see with our eyeballs. Um, though clearly the phenomenon he's describing is the, if you will, the primordial description of our ordinary way of seeing with eyeballs and so on and so forth, right? So discourse with others challenges the way we ascribe meaning to others, right? This is why it's very important 
Um, for instance, in, in a political society, a democracy that's plural and all its people have different views and different beliefs, it's important that we have discourse with each other because what discourse does is it disrupts the way in which we can ideologically totalize the other. Um, I think so, and also this also, discourse also represents an antidote, if you will, to the thematization that we see in society. Think about the way, for instance, at least here in the United States, Democrats talk about Republicans, or the way Republicans talk about Democrats, right? You can see it's the thematization of the other that's happening. Um, and discourse breaks that down, right? If you get a Democrat and a Republican together and they come together in a movement of authentic discourse, Right, as you know, defined how Levinas does in the earlier sections of the book. See the earlier videos if you haven't. Right, um, this moment of discourse, right, um, ultimately is what breaks that apart. Right, and this is why, for instance, institutions like the United Nations are important. Right, the United Nations does not um, provide um, a legal system to judge and punish other countries. Rather, it provides a forum for discourse. Right. Um, and that alleviates a lot of potential war as a consequence, right? Because it, it reinscribes an ethical relationship of alterity. Um, and so we see here the discourse and resistance of an interesting correlation. You might want to think about that uh, um, for the papers that you're writing or, um, um, or, or thinking about here, right? So I pulled a picture here. This is actually a photo that comes from one of my favorite photographers, Richard Avedon. Um, I believe from his American West series, so check it out, it's interesting, uh, or beautiful and disturbing at the same time. Uh, but I love his photography because he captures these faces where you see the person, but yet you can realize that they are other, right? They, you, I don't, so when I look at this gentleman's face here, right, I mean, there's many features of his face, but on the one hand, I can't ultimately capture or concretize who he is when I simply look at his face. And of course, when he speaks to me, this is when it occurs. So the face then concretizes the infinity of the other, right? As it were, the infinity of the other becomes manifest in a concrete form um, through the face, right? And the exteriority of the face is not given as a reason or as a concept, but really acts as an epiphany, right? So the face is an epiphany to me. Uh, and here, think of an ep the term epiphany as a way of describing a realization that's given from the outside, right? Epiphanies are not something that you can deduce, right? They, they sort of come in flashes. Um, and in the same way, the exterior of the face comes in a, in a flash, in an infinity, right? Um, and the epiphany of the face is that the face is self-sufficient. It's on its own, right? That's what its alterity is. And um, among uh, describing and commenting on other philosophers, Levinas here it gives the example of Aristotle's unmoved mover, where, where the unmoved mover is not something that moves, but is responsible for motion, right? And so the, the unmoved mover is something that remains ulterior, right, to the universe for Aristotle, yet central to it. Um, and in the same way, the other takes that infinite, infinite sort of functional role. Um, not in terms of motion, but in terms of the metaphysical relation he's been describing, right? Now, uh, but the other, absolutely other, the other does not limit freedom of the same, calling it to responsibility. It founds and it justifies it, okay? So that means that when I recognize the absolute otherness of the other in speech and language, then what we have here, he's saying that it's not that that other destroys my freedom, right? Remember, since it's other, it's not me, right? So I still have freedom, right? The difference, though, is that the, this metaphysical relationship is actually what justifies and is the found, serves as the, the metaphysical foundation for my freedom, right? So you can see here that Levinas takes an unexpected turn, potentially, um, in that he describes here that the, the absolute other, the infinite alterity of the other, right, is ultimately um, prior to and necessary for my freedom. Um, the, I need the other to be free, right? And it's interesting here to think about, uh, um, for instance, a person who lived on an island who never, who, let's say, uh, Robinson Crusoe who gets stuck on an island. Uh, when Robinson Crusoe is stuck on the island, there's no others around. So um, does that mean that he's free? I mean, you can see here, I would say, you may be saying no, but I think the answer is yes. Why is he free? Because he's still constituted by the other because of the language he speaks. Think here about the idea that language is always given 
by, by the other, right? No one has their own language, and you can think here about Wittgenstein's private language argument um, and how the idea that language is fundamentally uh, social, which means in Levinasian terms that it's grounded upon the alterity of the other, and so is my freedom, right? Okay, so that means that that's why, because I, because the, the alterity of the other grounds my freedom, that means that's why it begins this ethical relation, right? And we have this conception of ethics in the face, right? Now, the face limits power, not freedom, right? It limits my power, right? So he makes this distinction between power and freedom. Um, because the alterity of the other grounds me, it doesn't destroy my freedom, it justifies it, but the, the, the call of the other, right, through speech, what the other tells me limits the freedom I have with the other. Remember, the ethics Levinas is talking about here is not a series of normative principles to abide by, right? Ethics here is, Levinas is giving it it's a description of the ethical encounter, right? Um, of the existence of the ethical relation. Um, so that means that the face opens up this ethical dimension. Um, and that's really critical. And Levinas gives an interesting and in, in chilling, I think, discussion of killing and murder, for instance. He says, quote, to kill is not to dominate, but to annihilate. It is to renounce comprehension, absolutely. Murder exercises a power over what escapes power. I can wish to kill only an existent, absolutely independent, which exceeds my power infinitely, and therefore does not oppose them, but paralyzes the very power of power, right? The other is the sole being I can wish to kill. So here's this interesting, because uh, he's talking about, so when we try to kill the other, it's not that we, we're trying to have more power of the other, because the other is the grounds for my ethical power, my freedom to act. But because of that, right, my wish to kill them is actually, um, I can't destroy the other, right? Um, and so there's this interesting, interesting discussion of what killing um, and murder means in terms of um, a phenomenology that takes the alterity of the other seriously. Um, and I think it'd be interesting, for instance, to, to see what, for instance, people in the criminal justice side of the house would think about this different, very different conception um, of murder, right? Murder exercises power over what escapes power, right? Murder is, is, is this sort of kind of, at the end of the day, um, its own sort of paradox, right? Um, he, by the way, Levinas doesn't say that, but I think it's an interesting way of thinking about it. So accordingly, the other bears a form of ethical resistance, right? Even when I try to kill the other, I can't actually destroy the, I can destroy the, the way in which the others manifest. I can destroy the face of the other. But the alternative of the other always remains in principle ulterior, right? That's why, for instance, people who are in, in can, when people are tortured, right, um, they will resist the torture. What is the resistance there? And why would people torture other people? Well, ultimately, it's in order to capture that which cannot be captured in the power, right? And think about in the, the, the situation between the torturer and the tortured, right? Um, it's actually the tortured that has the, the priority, right? Because the person who's being tortured is being tortured because they resist, right? So that means that the entire operation is ultimately... Uh, phenomenologically, or I want to say ontologically, or I guess he would say metaphysically, gra is grounded on the other, right? And sort of think about that. Think who ultimately has the power in the, the torture and the tortured situation. Actually, the person who's being tortured has has the has the power, right? Um, so in, in through resistance, right? So the face reveals an op opposition, but not in terms of power, but in terms of transcendence. The face has no logical opposite, though, right? So when we talk about the face, it's not like we're talking about war and peace. So it's, war always is derivative conceptually on the contradictory of peace and so on and so forth, right? Those are conceptual equivalents. But because of the alterity of the other and the face, the face doesn't have an opposite, right? So that means that you can see here, I think Levinas is trying to describe the transcendency 
of the infinitude of the other. It transcends this sort of binary opposition. The face is not a binary, right? Um, and it's ultimately because he's going to use a language of asymmetry here, right? And this is what we would describe here as the an ethical plane of obligation. So when we talk about the obligation we have to the other, right, it is unit. Terry, uh, Levinas doesn't use those terms, but it is unified um, by the alterity of the other, not by a a by a, um, a, 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 um, a binary opposition or a logical contradictory, right? So when we talk about this, is taking obligation now seriously with regard to this conception of of uh, alterity and the infinitude of the thing. Okay. So the next thing Levinas says is, okay, well, what about reason? And we're going to see here that reason plays an important role. And it's also interesting, regardless of Levinas' overall arching discussion of ethics, it's interesting to see his, how, how his, his view here changes, really reorganizes uh, the philosophical conception of reason that he's working with, right? Because it means that language is now not just a simple information exchange, right? It's not just a, a diachronic sort of back and forth, right? It's really triadic now. Um, and it's not simply a giving of information because the alterity of the other remains, right? Its transcendency um, pertains. So that means that information, ex well, let's go back here. Because information exchange actually presupposes the originality of the face, right? Uh, the only way that I can gain information that's not, right, already within, totalized, is from the outside, right? So information exchange is not a credible um, alternative here to what's going on when we talk about language, um, right? The, the alternative face remains prior for him. So expression is not a transference of interiority either, right? So when the other tells me something, let's say the other says to me, do not kill me, right? Um, right? But that's not it. They're not transferring their interiority there, right? I'm not getting a sense of what it means to be them as such. Um, I mean, obviously, I understand and can analogically extrapolate, right? Um, but their, their experience of themselves and their experience as expressed in the, the, in the dictum not to kill, right, doesn't transfer their interiority. So it's not a transfer of consciousness or anything like this, right? And also the being of a face, he says, is not a value, right? The ethical relation is also not mystical here, right? And you may have been thinking that while we've been discussing and while you've been reading Levinas here, is that it almost sounds like Levinas is saying that when I see the other, I fall into a mystical relation in which they, right, it's, and think here about the famous mystical text in, for instance, Catholic thought, like, um, um, the cloud of the unknowing, right? God is something we don't know. All of our concepts fail, and so God just simply has to reveal, right? We have to give up on reason. This is not what Levinas is saying, right? He's saying it's not a mystical relation. It's carried out through language, and at the end of the day, language is reason, right? So the way in which language is given to me is is well is given to me through reason, and reason is this language. Right? The ethical relation is carried about through the relation to through the rational character of language. Right? He says discourse is a rupture. It's preeminently nonviolent, right? and it's nonviolent because discourse allows the other to express themselves, and violence seeks to 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 silence that expression. Um, and that ultimately, this discourse is given by reason and in reason. I um, mean, think here about the way in which we discussed previously the idea that. I mean, even, even Nietzsche says this, that language ha is it must be transcendental, right? Language must come from the other and, and, re and have an otherness operation to it. Um, and so I think in many ways, Levinas is picking up on that, those themes. Um, and of course, he, he says it's nonviolent. Now, I think that's where uh, Nietzsche would disagree, um, but um, they have completely different sorts of conceptions. Now, I pulled here some passages from 204 that I want to take a look at here. The first here he is, is, he says, the idea of infinity in me, implying a content overflowing the container, breaks with the prejudice of the maitics without breaking with rationalism, since the idea of infinity, far from violating the mind, conditions nonviolence itself, that is, 
it establishes ethics. So the other is not for reason a scandal that puts in a dialectic moving movement, but the first teaching, right? So the, the, the reason that is given by the other's language, by the other's speech, is the first ethical teaching, as it were. It's the way in which uh, the other teaches me who they are, right? And teaches me how I ought to be, right? This is the asymmetry of the relation. The face is the evidence that makes evidence possible. And that's because the face is the means by which language is given, and language is rationality. We're going to see him make that claim here in just a sec. Um, uh, discourse for him found signification. So normally what we would say is that language is composed of words, and those words um, are signifiers for certain sorts of things in the world or experiences, etc. Right? So you look in a dictionary, you look up a word, and the words, for instance, says, uh, I look up the word apple, and then it tells me it's a fruit. Right? So the word, usually we think of the word as being a signifier for the signified. It's a represent, it represents it. It's a sign. Right? And then what happens is discourse is founded upon that whole thing, right? Discourse is really just the play of significations. But here, Levinas is saying, no, 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 you have it upside down, in fact. Discourse is actually what enables signification, right? He says language, it's that, here is the idea that language is what conditions rationality, right? La that is, our, the speech we have with each other is ultimately what functions as the conditional upon which reason and rationality can be given. Think about the idea here that we can talk about um, people having, giving us their reasons, right? Uh, but ultimately here, discourse is, op is not a prior, but discourse is preeminently prior. Uh, I'm sorry, discourse is preeminently subsidiary upon language. It's not the idea here that rationality conditions language, right? It's not the idea that reason exists somewhere and that, that and now we have to talk because it's reasonable, but it's really the reverse. We have discourse and that enables, um, I'm sorry, we have language and that enables discourse, right? Um, that our language is what enables rationality, right? Um, so think here about, for instance, in analytic philosophy, if you're familiar with it, between the early log logicians of the 20th century who wanted to understand the logical structure of language. And they thought that they, they could figure out a sort of formula that all of our language must, and all of the meaning, and all of the stuff we do in philosophy, that all of that must be subsidiary to some sort of logical form. Um, kind of like how Newton articulates a, an equation um, for mechanical motion. Well, I think logicians wanted something similar, but what, what they discovered by um, the 1950s, um, and preeminently beginning with Wittgenstein, but before Wittgenstein, is the, is the idea that no, our rationality, the logic of our language, uh, right, is given by the actual language we have. Now, uh, by the actual discourse we engage in, right? Wittgenstein has this beautiful phrase, his language is like an ancient city with different streets, new areas and old areas, and things getting covered over, and so on and so forth, right? It's a sprawling sort of thing. So the language we have with each other, and for Levinas, it's instituted in this metaphysical moment, event, he says, that that is what is conditioning rationality itself. Um, so it's a, you know, a very different thing. So that means language is ultimately an event of being, uh, right? He says words ground the reason, words, is, words are what ground reason. And he talks about the problem of verbalism. If I get a moment, I'll mention it, right? Uh, verbalism, well, I'll jump right into it. Uh, he's talking about with regard to Husserl and Heidegger. Um, he says the mistrust of verbalism leads to the incontestable primacy of rational thought over the operations of expression that insert a thought into a particular language as, a, as into a system of signs or bind it to a system of light language presiding over the choice of these signs. And think here about the way in which um, Husserl invented a new language to talk about, uh, uh, talk about what he's doing um, in his early phenomenology. And then also think about Heidegger doing something similar, um, though much more radical, I would say. Um, the, the, all of that assumes that the words we use are grounded upon some sort of rationality that comes beforehand. And here Levinas is, of course, rejecting that and saying, no, no, that's not the case, right? Um, rather, the signification 
makes the sign function. So the way in which we signify things with each other, the way in which language is used, is ultimately what gives us the, the, the groundwork for how our signs function, how the rationality of our concepts are related to each other. So that means that the event of the other is what's ultimately um, giving the meaning behind the sign function. So that means that language here, uh, which is given to me from the other in the situation, it's the way the other expresses themselves in their infinity, right? That means that, that what this does is that that's ultimately, that metaphysical situation is ultimately the grounding for all of the logical uh, principles that we find in the world, right? Uh, that ultimately they're social, as it were, right? So that means that we're moving here in Levinas from a question of what to an emphasis on who, from ontology to ethics, right? So the face is not consciousness, but an ethical call, right? Consciousness is an ontological description here. Right, or consciousness refers in Husserl to a certain ontological condition, and so does it for Heidegger. But the face is not just consciousness here, it is an ethical call. So that means language is reason. And I want to really emphasize this because and this is I've taken it directly from his text here. Right? He says, when reason gets conceived as a naturalism, language begins to function as an object or a form, a modality of consciousness. Right? Um, so, that, so that is when we try to think of uh, reason as something that's natural, a natural object in the world, that changes consciousness. And what it is, is ultimately a movement of totality. Um, and here he mentions Husserl, and it's important here to recognize that Husserl's phenomenology has been classically... Um, criticized for leading to a form of solipsism where you can't really ever get to the other. You're always just pairing and um, sort of predicting and through and through empathy uh, a relationship with the other, but ultimately you're still isomorphic to yourself and you really don't have access to others. And this is a big criticism of Husserl and in many ways Levinas is joining in that criticism, though he doesn't mention solipsism directly, I don't believe. Um, but you can see here that that's exactly what Husserl does. Everything becomes a function of consciousness, and, and that means that, as a result, everything becomes solipsistic, right? But here's Levinas's point. If reason is language, then social pluralism must be a condition of language, not its antithesis. So what this means is that when we reconceive of reason as language, then that and we recognize that language is given through the other, then that means that social pluralism is the condition of language, that is, having multiple others, right? Um, so plurality here. In many ways, you can see here that Levinas's phenomenology really offers an interesting way of thinking, for instance, about issues of diversity and plurality, social plurality, in ways which are quite radical and in many ways just simply not possible in earlier Husserlian phenomenology and also within Heideggerian ontology. Okay, okay. so what does that mean about language and objectivity, though? Does that mean that when we, when we use language and use reason, we have objectivity? Well, it sort of functions like this. We go from the other, then we move to language. Whoops, let me move in here, right? The other, right, the other is announced through language, right? And then I have designations for the other, and I have my ways, and then I modify my forms of enjoyment accordingly, right? That's sort of a really simplistic way of, of seeing um, this basic setup that he's sketching out for us, right? So here's the thing, Conscien consciousness of the object, right, which is a thematization, ultimately rests on a distance with regard to oneself, which can only be time, or if one prefers it, rest on self-consciousness, right? So think about, I have the, the, the cup of water here, um, and when I, and I recognize it object, when I recognize it as an object, right, so the consciousness of it is a thematization. But that thematization ultimately rests upon a recognition that I'm not that thing, right? So that means there's a distance between me and that thing. That distance is ultimately a recognition of our own self-consciousness, or it's a function of self-consciousness, right? But here's the thing. The infinity of the other cannot be thematized, right? We can't thematize the other. Um, and so that means that the other remains outside of our bounds. And he gives, it's interesting, um, he really loves the history of philosophy because he keeps, you know, he loves Descartes. 
because uh, Levinas goes back to Descartes and he says at the end of Descartes' third meditation we have this discussion of the infinity that, that, um, that Descartes gives uh, when he because remember Descartes argues for the perfection and infinity in a positive sense in order to get to God and so on and so forth right but that that positive sense is overwhelming and here's what Descartes says he says it seems to me right to linger for a while on the contemplation of this all-perfect God to ponder at his leisure his marvelous attributes to intuit to admire to adore uh, the incomparable beauty of this inexhaustible life so far at least as the powers of mind mind may permit dazzled as they are by what they are endeavoring to see notice he's talking about vision right he says for just as by faith we believe that the supreme felicity of the life to come consists in the contemplation of the divine majesty, so do we now experience that a similar meditation, though one so much less perfect, can enable us to enjoy the highest contentment of which we are capable in this present life. So you see here a way in which Levinas is saying, listen, the other, right, also there's a moment of enjoyment and beauty that we find in the other here, right? in this positive overflowing of infinity. We can never grasp that infinity, so we can um, uh, we can never uh, capture it as it were. It's much less perfect, but yet it represents the highest form of life, right, for us. And so he's describing the situation here accordingly. Um, let's go back here. Okay, let's keep going here. And by the way, there's a lot more of these chapters that I'm sort of, I'm sort of jumping over and and I realize that as I'm doing this, so bear with me, right? Now, when we talk about others, that means it's social plurality here is the norm. And this is where he says language offers justice, right? Language, in, which gives us reason um, and ultimately objectivity, but not objectivity of the other, right? Um, this ultimately is what grounds justice, right? Um, and here you can think about the way in which, for instance, social contract theory, this is not what Levinas says, but in a way in which social contract theory intuits this metaphysical transcendent relationship, but does but expresses it in a way that's ultimately bound up with a whole bunch of epistemological categories or miscategorizations, especially with regard to empiricism. Uh, so there's some interesting things going on there. Now the word of the other, he says, is a prophetic word, right? Because it is it is an epiphany, it's a revelation, right? So it's something that goes beyond us. Right. He says, now it's interesting, he says there, so when we're talking about the, so, the social situation, the other's language be, is beyond us. Now, when we talk about human beings, right, when we talk about, to think about all human beings, we think about it as a genus, biologically it's true, right? So I'm a human, you're a human, and, and she's a human, and right, she's a human, and he's a human, and so on and so forth, right? We're all humans biologically, and so we're all, we can all be totalized as a biological category. But when we talk about human culture, human civilization, as, um, uh, as an instituted in language, quote, where the interlocutors remain absolutely separate, this does not constitute the unis of a genus, right? So that means that the plurality of the social situation is not one single thing, right? And you can see here how he has a very different conception than someone like Hegel ultimately, right? Because he wants to take human social plurality seriously. So that means that equality is a function of the other, right? Um, society is ultimately a fraternal community, right? Um, and so this is really an important part. It's a fraternal community in which uh, we have ethical relations to, to each other, to respect each other. Um, and and it, that's an infinite relationship, but it's also one in which everyone is other, right? One in which you have total plurality. So that means that that total plurality is the uh, the that total plurality of otherness, absolute otherness, is ultimately what we're talking about when we say we're equal, right? So that means that equality now does not refer to a conception where I am equal because I have rational and you're equal because you have rational. I think of Kant or I'm equal because I have a certain type of soul and you're equal because you have a certain type of soul. Think of Aristotle, right? Or Plato or someone like this. Equality on those ordinary philosophical um, views is grounded upon certain um, conditions and faculties, right? Certain um, examples of what can be thematized, certain objectivities. Here, the alterity of the other, equality is grounded in precisely that which I can't capture. So you have your a guarantee of 
and equality because otherness is the means by which it's given, right? And society is a fraternal community among these others. So we have here now a, a sort of social fabric that really is, gets conceived of in terms of an asymmetry of the interpersonal, right? The other opens up this height of asymmetry between each other, and the separation from the other is a modification of our existential enjoyment, our egoism, right? Um, Levinas says, speech is not instituted in a homogenous or abstract medium, but in a world where it's necessary to aid and to give, it presupposes an I, an existing separated in its enjoyment, which does not welcome empty-handed the face and its voice coming from another shore. Multiplicity in being, which refuses totalization, but takes form as fraternity in discourse, is situated in a space essentially asymmetrical. Right? And remember, this is also nonviolent for him, right? Uh, so the discourse is nonviolent fundamentally, because it's the means by which the other uh, can communicate this asymmetry. So the interpersonal is an asymmetrical thing. So that means that when we think of society, the society is not a basically a series of monads that interlock and interrelate. It's not a Leibnizian conception, because there's there's it's a, to one of metaphysical a, a asymmetry and transcendence. So let's think about the will and reason. He says he's, he's real, well, he doesn't say it, but he is against idealism. He says this conception that we've sketched out in terms of the ethical situation is not an idealism, right? Idealism always reduces ethics to politics, right? And he has a critique against Kant and Hegel here. And think about the way Hegel sacrifices all of the individuals ultimately for social institutions that enable consciousness, right? The absolute consciousness and Hegelian idealism here, right? This is a situation where the ethical situation, the one to the other, gets reduced into a political medium, into an institutional fabric. And think, when you just have politics but you have no ethics, you can have what? Totalitarianism, right? Um, so you see here that uh, if we're talking about something like democracy, democracy fundamentally requires a continual, a preemptively captured, capturing by the other um, to maintain the ethical situation. Uh, the individual, right, doesn't just get sacrificed um, to the higher order to reason, right, to some sort of idealistic reason, right? He says, the quote, the individual and the personal are necessary for infinity to be able to be produced as infinite. Uh, so infinity is uh, ultimately plays its own self-sufficient role, it looks like, right? The will is free, right? So each individual person has freedom, which is ultimately founded, right, by the other. Um, but they're not free to refuse the responsibility to the other, right? That's the uh, why it's an ethical domain, this situation. The ethical presence of the other is, an, is a nonviolent imposition, right? So the other doesn't destroy me, so I am free, but the other imposes upon me. Um, and that is an ethical form of obligation, right? Okay, so given that, and I want to be sort of quick here, Levinas then begins to discuss the ethical relation in time. So he has a discussion of temporality here. Now, the metaphysical relation is pluralistic, right? So we're talking about all of this um, inter um, asymmetrical, interpersonal um, relations, right? And that means that we're talking about subjectivity and pluralism. Now, pluralism is diversity united, right? So that's what pluralism means here. And we can say that the social relation is an ultimate event. Um, in this sense, it's ultimate in this transcendent sense, right? Because ultimately, the social relation is, is primordial. It's a primordial social event, and it depends upon that, right? And here he wants to say that the social relation then is not a form of war and economy. It's not a form of, think of Hobbes here, a way of trying to overpower others. And it's not a form of economy either. Think about Marx here, right? It's something that's primordially given, right? When we, when we talk about war, what is war? And there's an interesting discussion you may want to follow up with. War is a refusal of the totality by, of the totality of the other, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a refusal of totality, actually, interestingly enough. And I guess, on the other hand, you could also say that war is also... Um, is, is a way, is a way, is an attempt to totalize the otherness of the other, right? Um, so, in it, but, in, but the refusal, so when people are at war with each other, the other is an enemy 
precisely because they have their totality has to be refused, right? Um, quote, a being independent of, and yet at the same time exposed to the other, is a temporal being. To the inevitable violence of death, it opposes its time, which is postponement itself, right? So we have here this notion that, okay, so to, to be exposed to the other reveals that one must be a temporal being. You're existing in time, right? And that means that war, when he sort of has this going commentary about war, war requires the other and language, and it's ultimately an event or temporality, right? Um, it is the transcendence of the other which grounds our freedom. And the, the response for the other is not made, marked by good intention, right? So when I'm in an ethical situation with the other for Levinas, it's not sufficient to say, oh, I just have to have good intention. Obviously, he's thinking about Immanuel Kant here. Um, he says, because good intention is a residue of enjoyment, right? Um, here, I have good intention because I enjoy good intention, right? And it's a residue of that. So he thinks it's phenomenologically not derivative, right? Um, separation is ultimately what constitutes freedom here. Pardon me. Now, we can see here that, because remember, he's arguing against this notion of war and commerce here as being the, the primary social relation. Uh, but temporality is this functional thing, right? So temporality is ultimately part of what's constituting our social relationships here, right? Um, it's fundamental because we are temporal beings. And think here about Heidegger's conception of time and historicity, right? Um, uh, let's start off here. Uh, Levinas says, the, corpore um, corpore the corporeity um, thus describes the ontological regime of a primary self-alienation, contemporaneous with the very event by which the self ensures, against the unknown factor of the elements, its own independence, that is, its possession or its security, right? So corpore corporeality here, the idea that we're, we're in space, in reality, extended, right? Our bodies describe our ontology um, of being ourselves, right, against others, right? Now, when we talk about time here, that means that we end up by talking about history. He says, history in which the interiority of each will manifest itself only in plastic form, in the muteness of products, is an economic history. So it's interesting here, remember, he's not talking about necessarily about economics, though that would count, right? He's saying, when we, when we try to treat um, the will of others and, and take them out of, uh, take away their transcendency, then what happens is it becomes an economic history. It becomes a history of exchange and causal relationships, right? Um, he says, but fate does, and then it looks like fatalism, but he says, fate does not precede history, it follows it, um, right? Fate is given according to this historical, uh, the sort of social relations. Now, he says, the body is the ontological regime for the corpore corporeality of the will. And the recognitions of the other's will is not a thought, but morality, right? So to recognize the other's will is not to think anything, but it's to be invoked and involved in this relation. Um, and that's the, the moral situation. Um, and we're talking about the will of the other then, which he says, quote, the will awaits its investiture and pardon. It awaits them from an exterior will, but one from which it would experience no longer shock, but judgment an exteriority withdrawn from the antagonism of wills, withdrawn from history, right? Um, so we have this sort of, this. The, we have Levinas here describing or attempting to describe the way in which uh, history and temporality begins to play a role in the, in, the, in the moral situation in which I become involved and indebted to the other, right? Um, so will and death. Now, he begins talking about death here, and he'll, he'll close off the passage of his discussion here, and we'll close off our discussion as well um, here in just a moment. Now, most of us think of death as nothingness, right? Uh, where I've just vanquished, right? And if I'm murdered, then I'm just going to nothingness. And in fact, death, even if I'm not murdered, even if I just die, if I think of death as a nothingness, death seems like a menace because it just murders me. I'm gone. But he's going to say here that when we talk about the will and we talk about death, the menace of death is not nothingness, but it's imminence. The idea that it's coming and yet hasn't come. That's ultimately the problem of death um, for him. It's not, and notice here, this is about time. You can see why he wanted to talk about temporality first. Because 
of death is an imminence, is to talk about the temporality with which I expect something to happen, but yet it remains postponed, as it were. And here the idea is that death lies beyond my horizon. The other threatens death, right? Because in death here is an impossibility of knowing. On the one hand, it's an impossibility of me knowing, but also the other's threat is also its own form of impossibility of knowing, right? Um, he writes, when, what, he says, one does not know when death will come. What will come? With what does death threaten me? With nothingness or with uh, recommence? He says, I do not know, right? Here's this emphasis is that death is itself the impossibility of knowing. So a death approaches us as a mystery. Now remember we're given in time. And also think about here, just as a sort of cross-reference, that Heidegger sees Dasein as a being towards death. Death approaches as a mystery. And we have this, that's what the imminence of death is talking about. So that means the imminence here is really a combination of time plus postponement. Um, uh, right? And he's thinking here about the way in which ultimately the other can 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 make me fear for my life, right? I, um, the other can threaten me with death, right? But here's the thing: even death, he says, cannot drain all meaning from life, right? So I like how he uh, he doesn't give he does he he finds a boundary for death. Death doesn't destroy all of the meaning towards life. So Levinas here is not a nihilist. Um, he's a social pluralist. Um, he's an exterioritist, I suppose, or something like this, an infinitudist, right? But he's, what he's not is he's not a nihilist, right? Because the other is what grounds meaning, right? Um, now, death, of course, threatens meaning, right? Um, but it doesn't overwhelm it and destroy it, right? Um, now, when we talk about death, and we talk about the imminence of death, and that means what we're talking about is patience. So what's this relationship? He says it's the relationship between time and the will. He says, think about the precarity of courage in the face of time, right? The, the difficulty, the fragility of courage in the face of time. If you have to face something, like think about a time in your life when you had to do something you were worried about. Um, and, and, it, and it was maybe in a week or two and you knew it was coming up. And think about that being courageous in the face of time is a sort of precarious precarious situation. And he remarks about the marvel of time. Um, and here you get the sense that Levinas is a true philosopher given um, to the subject at hand. And he remarks that, I think it's quite beautiful here, is that the temporality plays such an integral role with the will in, in a way in which we exist here. And it's, and it's really marvelous. Um, there's a great marvel in an in a infinite um, beauty, I think, to it. That's my words, not his. Now, consciousness is a resistance to violence because it leaves time, right? So, consciousness is, is a way in which um, time gets suspended, right? Um, and, and it resists violence in that sort of sense. Now, when we talk about time and suffering, suffering is actually the impossibility of fleeing in time, right? Um, your inability to get away. And so that's why if you're in the situation and you're worried about something, right? You can't escape it. That's what the suffering is, right? The event hasn't occurred, so, so there's nothing that's actually hurting you. But the suffering, though, is there. But it's in terms of this impossibility of escaping time. And think about the way in which death approaches and we can't escape it. So there is, if you will, a sense in which we could talk about the suffering unto death. Here I immediately think of Kierkegaard in which his despair, he has conception of despair. So take a look at that if you're interested. Consciousness in its ultimate passivity is a form of patience, right? He says, the supreme ordeal of freedom is not death, but suffering. To inflict suffering is to reduce the other to the rank of object, but on the contrary, is to maintain, to maintain him superbly in his subjectivity. Think again about that description between the torturer and the tortured, right? To suffer is the supreme ordeal of freedom, quite, quite, um, Quite beautiful and fanciful, I think. Uh, the truth of the will. Now, here Levinas turns his attention to the idea that the inner life is an event of being. And, and when we combine that with the idea that the other is alienated, the other alienated the will, right? The, the, the way in which the other alienates our will, right? That means that it's not the nothingness that we seek to surmount in death, but it's the passivity of the will in the face of death's imminence, right? Um, so when we talk about here, um, uh, the relationship of time and our relationship of death, right? 
um, because that's ultimately what, what time is moving us towards, right? Um, that is the, the, the problem there. The suffering is actually the passivity of our will, a resignation of postponement, a resignation of waiting. So let's bring this together with history, truth, and justice. History then is a form of judgment, right? History becomes a way in which we, we can judge and understand things, right? But the infinity of responsibility denotes not its actual immensity, but a responsibility in the measure that it is assumed duties that its assumed duties become greater in the measure that they are accomplished, right? So he's trying to combine here the notion that on the one hand, history is a moment of judgment, right? Um, and we can judge ourselves historically, right? But this infinity of responsibility um, is we need to take seriously, right? The call to infinite responsibility confirms the subjectivity in its apologetic position. And think here about apology, not I'm sorry, but the apology that Socrates has, a defense, right? The, the infinite responsibility confirms that in subjectivity, we have a call to defend and to respond to ourselves against, for instance, these historical thematizations, right? Justice requires the unicity of subjectivity, the unity of these subjects. Um, and the deepening of the inner life is not a historical character, right? It is something that the inner life is exalted by truth, right? Um, and, and we did in a previous video talk about truth. Well, um, whoops, let me go back here. I guess I didn't put that in there. Um, take a look here at this quotation um, from Levinas. He says, quote, The inner life is exalted by the truth of being, by the existence of being in the truth of judgment. It is indispensable for truth, being the dimension in which something can be opposed clandestinely to the visible judgment of history, which seduces the philosopher. Yet this inner life cannot forego all visibility. The judgment of consciousness must refer to a reality beyond the sentence produced by history, which is also a cessation and an end. Hence, truth requires as its ultimate condition in infinite time, the condition of both goodness and the transcendence of the face, the fecundity of subjectivity, by which, I, by which the I survives itself, is a condition required for the truth of subjectivity, the clandestine dimension of the judgment of God. But for this condition to be realized, it is not enough that infinite time be given. Um, uh, because, of course, we die. So you can see here, um, the, this is his discussion of exteriority and the, say, and, and the face. And ultimately at the end here, what we see um, with Levinas here is that what the other does is the other grounds our language. And it's through the face, through our, the sensation of the say, face that gives way to language. And it's through the speech of the other that grounds our very freedom itself, that constitutes our freedom. And that freedom is asymmetrical. Um, and ultimately, our existence in life is given according to these te this temporal interpersonal social relation um, and this is this is this is ultimately what it means to talk about ethics again Levinas's first philosophy his ethics gives us a sort of um, his ethics gives us uh, a situational description not a series of normative claims that we should adopt um, right those are given in reason and through life and through our practices with the other. And they're given through the call of the other. And ultimately, he then discusses the temporality and, and the question of our, our, our fear of death and the imminence of death and the notion of we also have to resist the historical thematizations that death represents to us, right? The idea that we'll, be, we'll become nothing more than just a story, right? And that that's not, the, the, the meaning cannot be extinguished and is not simply reducible to that framework. Um, so you have here with Levinas and his discussion in Totality and Infinity that if we take the notion of infinity seriously and we take the, the absolute otherness of the other in our concrete bodied situations, we, we are automatically engaged into an ethical domain. Uh, one where the other grounds my responsibility um, and, and how fundamental this ultimately is. Now, this is our last video in phenomenology. And so I hope you see that we've looked at three different philosophers over the course of these series of videos. We've looked at um, Husserl, who in many ways provides um, the first foundation for understanding the knowledge of consciousness, phenomenology. And in our second philosopher, uh, that we've been reading, 
Heidegger, we saw an ontological organization derived from phenomenology uh, towards the question of being, and we looked at discourse, Dasein, and so forth. And finally, with Levinas, we see here a phenomenology of ethics. So hopefully, you can see here that what I've tried to do in this series of videos is give you a taste, and really that's all I have given you, is just a simple taste of the way in which phenomenology can really inform the epistemological, the uh, ontological, and metaphysical, and ethical uh, conceptions we have about the way in which we exist in reality. I hope this has been interesting. Thank you so much for watching. It's been a pleasure um, and I wish you all the best and hopefully I'll see you online um, in the future. Thank you very much. Goodbye.